session is specifically dedicated to tactile diagrams. And Robert Jaquist is our first speaker. Um, we will start with, um, with discussing different uh, methods of printing tactile diagrams and how, how they can be used in different settings, but also, Robert, maybe you can say a few words about the latest and state of the arts in, in tactile printing. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lemon. And my areas of expertise are tactile graphics. I also, of course, as do my colleagues, uh, have familiarity with the various screen readers and optical character recognition systems, braille displays, and braille embossers. Uh, there are a number of ways to produce tactile graphics. Uh, I will kind of hit some of the going from kind of least expensive to most expensive. Probably the least expensive and most time consuming is what I would call the collage method. Uh, somebody takes a piece of braille paper or a tag board and glues on whatever junk they can find. And uh, I, that may be J-U-N-Q-U-E junk, but uh, it does amount to people gluing on embossed uh, heavy craft foil, sandpaper, pieces of braille paper, cardboard, strings, pasta products. Uh, I've even seen people use seeds. Uh, I even saw one person use, um, they wanted some heart-shaped symbols, and they used heart-shaped soda crackers. And this whole mess is then put inside a machine called a thermoform machine. A piece of plastic is put on top. Heat is applied. Vacuum is applied. And you have a plastic copy. That is probably, and, and you can keep doing this until the master wears out. As far as uh, some, now some people actually make a collage and uh, use it directly for blind people. I mean, some of the things my parents made, my mother glued stuff together, and I looked at it, and that was that was done. And that's probably the oldest, the oldest system that there is. The thermoform machine came out in the early 60s, and that made it possible to reproduce people's creations in textbooks. The disadvantage of this collage method is all this different kinds of stuff. It, sometimes it doesn't glue, and especially when people use food products. People love spaghetti because you could get it wet and you could lay it down on a page and and you could make it, if you got it wet so it was kind of flexible, you could make it in really beautiful curves and stuff. And of course it would be slightly sticky so it would stick down when it dried. Of course the mice and the rats just loved it. You know, it was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I, I advocate that people uh, stay away from food products when they're making this stuff. Probably the next area up, as far as um, technology goes, is what I would use call uh, swell paper. A piece of very special paper is put into an inkjet printer or sometimes a photocopy machine, if you're brave. And an image is copied on it with carbon-based ink or carbon copy toner. The result is that when you put this page through a special uh, heater, the raised image, the black image, raises up. And basically, the paper is uh, coated with microcapsule solutions. And when the stuff gets hot where the carbon ink is, it raises up. So you can have a nice raised image. You can do nice things with that. It kind of is either raised or not. You can get a little bit of texturing with it. Depending upon how clever you are, you can get fairly nice graphics out of it. Uh, it takes practice to make that work. One advantage is that it's fairly quick. If you have computer files you can uh, generate, you can make uh, repeated copies. The machine to process the paper with is about $1,000. I personally like the Reprotronics machine the best. The others I don't think are as safe. The downside of the process is that the paper costs like 85 cents for eight and a half by 11 inch piece. And uh, you can get 11 by 17 inch pieces of it, but you're talking a dollar and a half per, per piece. And so you can't, you can't make lots of copies unless you have a large budget. Probably the next expensive device would be the Tiger printer. The Tiger printer is a impact printer. It makes raised dots on paper. 
the prices of these machines go from 6,000 to 10,000, and the uh, they're pretty good. They they can do some textures. They can do about four different he uh, heights of embossing, uh, but the lines are all dots. And for some things, it works. If you want an outline map, it'll work. If you want simple simple shapes, it, it's it's a good process. And you can do. You can do some interesting things with it. You can actually do pie charts and stuff with a Tiger printer, and it works well, and it'll make Braille for you. Uh, and for for a certain set of applications, a Tiger printer is great. The nice thing about the Tiger printer is that it uses paper. You can use plastic in it, but it uses paper, and the Braille paper is pretty inexpensive. You know, three, four, five cents a sheet. You can run off 50 sheets, and it's no big deal. You haven't broken the bank. One of the things that I think people have to understand is when you're making this tactile graphics and when you're learning how, and even when you're trying things with different students, you know, different folks like different strokes, and it will take practicing and experimenting. And I kind of like systems that, you know, I don't have to spend a dollar for every experiment I try. The next technology out there, which... I don't have equipment for, I have only looked at equipment and looked at the results, is a thing called a an engraver. Uh, Roland DG uh, produces a machine, it's called the EZ600-400. Uh, we're talking $12,000 roughly with all the options. The machine will carve a 15 by 25 inch image about an inch high, so you can do inch high bar relief. It will carve it in wood, plastic, and soft metal, uh, brass and aluminum. But it's kind of intended for wood and plastic. The neat thing about it is it's all computer control. You use a computer to design your uh, image, your whatever it is you want it carved. You put the piece, your pizza raw material in, and turn it loose, and go off for um, a long lunch. Uh, it can take you know, two and three hours, depending upon how complex and find a you know, carving tool you use. The advantage, the machine can do a lot of textures. It can do all kinds of heights uh, up to an inch. So you can do a lot of stuff with that. The, uh, the As I said, the machine's about a $12,000 machine, and so we're talking about uh, you know, a fairly expensive piece, but uh, hey, if school districts can afford a, a Tiger, $10,000 Tiger, well, these engraving machines isn't that much more of a stretch. The material material costs can vary. Uh, I mean, if obviously, if somebody puts in a chunk of brass, it's going to be kind of expensive. You can use, and I have seen used, uh, structural foam like you get Home Depot, or you know, some you use a, a two by six or a two by twelve scrap board. You know, and you get the, the surface fit quality will vary it, it, depending upon what you use. But it's not a, a bank breaker to um, experiment with things. Probably the next step up, and it's kind of a big step up, is the um, is a milling machine. A milling machine is like a wood carving router, uh, computer controlled, and the Mo Roland uh, MDX 650 is available. And this machine, complete with options, you can start in at about twenty six to twenty eight thousand. Uh, if you want to get the full-blown package with the tool changer and the rotating table, uh, you're looking at close to 40000 It will carve an object uh, 15 by 25 inches with a 6-inch height. Uh, there, it is also possible with this machine to car carve smaller objects, and you can carve the front side, then you can give a computer command. It will flip the thing over and carve the back side. You could, for instance, carve a horse on both sides, and then you kind of cut it away from the jig that holds it. Very nice pieces of equipment, very solid, well-built. Uh, they, too, can carve in a variety of materials as long as it's not hard stuff like iron and steel. You can do a lot of really fantastic stuff with, this, with those kinds of machines. The material cost is fairly low. I mean, wood, plastic, foam, uh, modeling wax, whatever you want to put in it. And you can get some nice shapes and for probably quite a lot of things, a lot of bar relief, 
and you could even do you know some uh, full three-dimensional uh, models if you wanted to take take a little practice, but one could. It has a lot of potential. Probably the last class of machines, the most advanced, uh, the most exotic, are what uh, are known as true rapid prototyping machines. These machines are computer-controlled devices that deposit layers of material. And some of these things range from the low 30,000s on up. I think the most expensive one that I think is reasonable to deal with is a $300,000 Stratasys Maxim machine. And a, that thing can make a model 23 inches square and 19 inches high. And they are used in industry for making models. The advantage of this kind of technology is you can make an ABS plastic or a polycarbonate uh, part or a model. You can make models with moving parts. They may be expensive, but they have the potential of making some very fancy uh, models. Uh, if you want to make one or two of something for a museum, the best way is to, of course, go to a service bureau, and there are such places, to have this kind of thing done. And then you can have a, a pretty durable plastic uh, part to look at. And of course, if you have a plastic part, they can be molded uh, with vacuum casting, and you can make you know dozens of them. There is another machine from Israel uh, known as an OJ Quadra. It uses epoxy, uh, which is uh, cured by light. It can make very fine details. The output is pretty durable. You wouldn't want to drop it because it could break, but you can get some really nice surface uh, finish on it. There is one other technology, and it's kind of exotic. It uses wax, and it can make parts with extreme fine detail with wax. Of course, the parts can't be handled. They have to be used as a master for a mold. That's pretty much on all the technology. I would say that I have a couple of sort of core axioms that I would use when I'm thinking about tactile graphics, and one of them is that there's no such thing as a one solution fits all. You have to think about what you're doing, what, what it's being used for, and then pick the uh, technology that's appropriate. I almost forgot to mention uh, Zactel Vision. They make a very nice, they have a very nice process, raised line images. And uh, you can get some nice raised line images and textures. And it's a process you can make lots of copies with. And that's a very nice process. It occurs to me, I, I kind of for missed one item. There's an outfit called Touch Graphics in New York, and Stephen Landau has a process. He uses a CNC machine to carve in a piece of plastic. He carves a negative mold. He can then pour silicon into that. Make, that makes a positive, and that he uses as a, his base for a thermoform copy. Uh, makes very beautiful thermoform, and it's very nice, and it's uh, an inexpensive way to duplicate that. But there's some really interesting technology out there. Uh, one of the things that I think is uh, has some real potential is there are some digitizers. So it is possible to digitize an object like a coin or some rare museum artifact, and you can digitize them in color, you can uh, digitize them straight, and you can make a plastic copy. So you can make a plastic copy of some Greek coin or an Indian arrowhead or whatever it is that you might have, and then you've got a plastic copy and people can handle.